Um, so uh, I'm David Kramer. I am the director of the library at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Uh, and it is our privilege, uh, the libraries and mine personally, uh, to be able to sponsor over the course of the year uh, a series of wonderful book talks, which uh, I must say uh, the, the Zoom um, capacity has made that much better because as opposed to having 35 people or 60 people in a room at Broadway on 122nd Street, uh, we're able to have, I see we now have 177 screens open so people from far and wide uh, can attend these presentations without your having to uh, schlep up to uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary, let alone a day like this when we would have had to cancel. Isn't it nice uh, that the weather did not force us to cancel? So uh, th there are some benefits to this uh, with all of the ways that we'd love to be able to get back together again. And I hope that I will be able to greet you in the library in the not too distant future. Um, let me uh, also just say uh, by way of introduction, uh, please keep your eyes open for our announcements in addition to book talks, and we still have a very rich schedule coming up for the remainder of this academic year. Uh, we also have a variety of other programs, including this sponsored by the library, including a tour of medieval Cairo. Uh, in the middle of this month. Uh, look for announcements about that. Uh, and we will also have a very oh, special series of programs during the month of April, just following Pesach, following Passover, um, devoted to Jewish music from a variety of perspectives. So we're expanding the range of our cultural programming and I'm quite confident uh, that you will enjoy those. So. Um, welcome for the evening to um, book talk presentation by Eliza Bemperat. Um, as you know from our promotions, but I'll repeat it anyhow, she teaches at, uh, she teaches East European Jewish history and Holocaust at the CUNY Grad Center and Queens College. Um, her um, earlier book, Becoming Soviet Jews, 2013, was a winner of the National Jewish Book Award and the book that we are here to hear something about tonight, Legacy of Blood, Jews, Pogroms, and Ritual Murder in the Lands of the Soviets, published um, this past year by Oxford, is also winner of the National Jewish Book Award. Um, so we're thrilled, Alyssa. We know that, uh, um, you know, I often say by way of introduction that it's uh, our task to uh, offer talks on important books of the day with importance uh, being defined in multiple ways. Um, here, I think the title itself will convey to everybody um, why this is so important a book and we look forward to what you have to say. I'm gonna try to spotlight you um, and that way everyone will see you uh, over the course of, our, uh, of your presentation. Go right ahead. Wonderful. Um, good evening, everyone. Hi um, um, to everyone. And uh, thank you, David, for this generous introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Um, let me see. Um, let me make sure that everything... Um, slideshow. Yeah, you're good. We can, I mean, yes, from we can the see beginning, the here we are. And here you can see the cover of the book. Um, so um, I want to start by telling you um, how I came to this topic. And the idea to write this book actually originated from an anecdote and from what I call the power of the archives. I was in Vilna or Vilnius where I spent eight months in 2007, when the city actually was the capital of European culture. And I was finishing my first book and I socialized with colleagues. And one of them, a Lithuanian historian of early modern Lithuania, um, she shared with me the following anecdote, which had, you know, had an impact on me. She, she, you know, she was teaching a course on uh, the early modern period on the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, 16th, 17th century, and she was discussing Jewish culture and religion. 
And because it was at the time of Easter Passover, she thought that it would be very nice to bring to class matzah. Now, of course, matzah in Lithuania is rather exotic. It's not like here, you can find it at CBS, right? So she thought it would be interesting. And she offered it to the students. And lo and behold, only three out of 40 tasted the matzah. And with great naivete, I asked her why? At which she replied surprised. And she said, wait, you are a historian of Eastern European Jewry. So what do you think they assumed might have been in the matzah? Now, of course, she was referring to the century old false accusation that Jews need blood for ritual purposes. Now let's leave aside Lithuania in 2007 for a minute. Um, I mean, I, I was in Lithuania in 2007 and I was um, reading, I was reading the Soviet press um, from the 1930s and I found reference to instances of accusations against Jews of ritual murder. The 1930s, really? The scholarship has nothing about the 1930s or the 1920s, right? The assumption for those of you who have, and I'm sure that most of you are well read in the topic, the assumption is that um, the last major accusation against Jews of ritual murder is, um, is the well-known Bailey's affair of 1911, 1913 in Kiev. Bernard Malamud wrote about it. Um, and this case was then followed by a 30 year uh, hiatus um, until the Kelce pogrom of 1946 when Holocaust survivors in Poland are accused of ritual murder and are killed in a pogrom. So the question emerged, you know, because of the anecdote and because of the 1930s, what I found about the 1930s was what happened to the blood libel in the context of the Soviet territories after 1917, um, when, when Russia became the Soviet Union, in the context of a system that at least on paper struggled, albeit not uh, perfectly um, and far from systematically, struggled against anti-Semitism, right? Condemned anti-Semitism. Uh, which was outlawed by Lenin in 1919. So how did this accusation persist in the 20s and 30s? How did it change? How did it continue to surface in the context of this modern atheistic society like the Soviet one? Which social groups claimed Jewish ritual murder in Soviet society? And was it peasants or was it members of the Communist Party who was supposedly enlightened, right? Which factors triggered these accusations and who were the victims? And also, which strategies did Jews employ to combat these accusations of ritual murder and to convince the Soviet state that this was false? So these are some of the questions that the book deals with. Now, in answering some of these questions, I was also reminded um, of the words of a major uh, historian who was very influential uh, in my academic career, Jonathan Frankel, uh, great historian of Russian Jewry, who uh, wrote about the ritual murder in Damascus in 1840. Um, and he reminded historians who focus on modern times that the right question to ask is not, how is it possible that this myth still exists? Um, that's not the right question to ask. Historians have, in a way, mistakenly focused on the gradual marginalization of the ritual murder charge over the span of the last 350 years and have overlooked the extraordinary vitality of this false myth in modern times, in contemporary times too. Ritual murder should be investigated in the context of the modern Jewish experience. It is a byproduct of modernization. It is, in a way, it grows out of the dark side of modern times. Um, think about the power of the irrational uh, rumors in, in our society, right? And I'll come back to conspiracy theories and QAnon at the end of the talk. Um, but if the irrational 
is an essential ingredient of modernization, then the blood libel could surely become a factor in the hyper-rational modern atheistic society that the Bolsheviks strove to create. Now, the second reason why I decided to write this book uh, lies in what I call the power of the archives, whereby I mean the extent to which the narratives we shape as historians are guided to a large degree by the material we are able to uncover in our journey through the archives. A few years later, you know, after I was in Lithuania, I was very lucky to have a fellowship and I spent some time working with one of the most extraordinary archival collections um, on modern um, Jewish life, especially in Eastern Europe. I'm referring to the Cherikov, Elias Cherikov uh, archives that are held at Yivo. And I was, again, I was looking for other things. I was looking for, I was studying social, uh, I thought I was going to study uh, aspects of everyday life in the Soviet Union. Um, and I came across, so I was looking for snippets in, from um, the press in Ukrainian and in Yiddish, and I came across the pogroms of the Russian Civil War. Um, now, I, I gave you the quote here uh, by historian Elias Cherikov, who made it his mission to collect the records uh, and materials about these pogroms uh, that represent an unprecedented wave of anti-Jewish violence that followed the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 and that ended in 1921. And this is how he defined the, um, these pogroms. Um, I also want to give now, uh, I want to show you this. Um, I'm going to move forward. I will come back. This is how other Jews at the time defined these pogroms, right? They compared it to the Armenian genocide uh, or this other quote, everywhere the systematic and, uh, and more or less complete annihilation of the Jewish population token is taking place. This is 1919, it's not 1941. Let me go back um, here. So, um, and I came across the witness accounts collected by an extraordinary woman, Rocho Feigenberg, who you see here, um, who was a Yiddish writer. She, was, uh, she moved to Warsaw and then she moved to uh, Ukraine. And she experienced herself this wave of anti-Jewish violence, these pogroms. Um, and in the summer of 1919, when the pogroms reach uh, the peak, she managed to flee from Ukraine, from the shtetl, where she lived in Ukraine, uh, to a larger city in Odessa. And she managed to flee with her newborn son, who you see here, this is a photograph taken later uh, in uh, Palestine. And, um, and actually she managed to, to, uh, to, um, to flee cave, uh, of anti-Jewish violence by hiding among peasants of a nearby village where uh, um, a woman helped her disguise herself. Uh, she gave her a folk dress with the Ukrainian national colors and she gave a little cross for her son um, uh, to, you know, to, to put around his neck so that he would seem Christian. So what is interesting is, let me read to you a quote uh, by Feigenberg. Um, Jew murderers were still roaming around the Balta roads and signposts were still hanging from the telephone poles, calling on people to kill all little Jewish boys because when they grow up, they will all be communists. This is another conspiracy theory of Judeo-Bolshevism, an affinity, the, the, the conspiracy according to which there is an affinity between Jews and communists. I can come back to that later. But there was something very different, very um, unique in the experience of these pogroms, truly unprecedented. Um, here I'm just showing you the image of, of, um, of a refugee a woman whose three sons were killed and her other son is wounded. Um, uh, Rojo Feigenberg herself was a refugee and she, um, she recorded the experiences of other refugees she is the only woman who worked together with um, Elias Cherikov collecting these materials. Um, and she recorded the, the violence in a number of smaller uh, shtetlach and towns that were completely wiped off the 
uh, face of, uh, of the earth. Um, and the, the, she, she talks about the military violence, the violence carried out by the white forces, Ukrainian directorate, peasant bands, um, Polish troops, Red Army troops, but she also talks about neighbors killing neighbors in the aftermath of World War I in the midst of new forms of extreme violence that tapered the inhibition to kill and witness murder. Um, and she also wrote this account that I'm showing you here from the archives, Churben Dubove, the destruction of Dubove, this small shtetl, um, which is based on interviews she carried out with, um, with refugee, without uh, refugees. And at, what is so interesting is at the end of the civil war, even the Jewish memory of Dubove was completely erased. Uh, as the local peasants destroyed the Jewish cemetery, plowed up and sowed it, tearing down its gravestones. This account was then published in book form, and I'm showing you here this, uh, the, the Yiddish original. Um, and it was later translated into Russian, uh, which means that it was being, that it was read by Soviet Jews in the interwar period in the 1920s and 1930s, which led me to think about the legacy of these programs, the legacy of this trauma for the second largest Jewish community in pre-Holocaust Europe, that is Soviet Jews. While thousands of Jews like Feigenberg herself managed to flee the so-called bloodlands, as historian, as historian Tim Snyder calls the territories that today are you know, Ukraine, Belarusia, Poland, and Lithuania, most of those who experienced the violence remained in what would become the Soviet Union. We are talking about approximately 2,000 pogroms. As many as 150,000 Jews were killed, 300,000 Jewish children were orphaned, and hundreds of thousands were wounded. Thousands of women were raped, perhaps as many as one out of 12 in Ukraine uh, and Jewish property was completely destroyed. So this experience is not integrated into modern Jewish history. It, of course, it is overshadowed by the Holocaust that took place in those same territories some 20 years later. Um, but it is not in, integrated into uh, trying to explain modern Jewish history, trying to explain uh, Soviet Jewish history. How did these pogroms affect the choices made by Jews who could not or did not want to flee the regime in formation? How did the memory of this violence affect their identity and interact with the identity of previous pogroms, the pogroms, you know, Kishinev or the pogroms of 1881, 1882? How did this, how was this violence commemorated by the state, by its citizens? Um, this trauma left um, a very important imprint, I would say, on Soviet Jews and their relationship with the Bolshevik state, uh, with their neighbors, and shaped new communities of violence um, and new communities of memory. Here you see a very powerful uh, image of Jews collecting um, the remains of, um, of those who were killed during the pogroms because they have to give them a Jewish burial. Um, and you see some Jewish Red Army uh, soldiers as well. So this experience was a founding one for Soviet Jews, uh, especially against the backdrop of a new society that saw the virtual disappearance of pogroms. Pogroms do not take place in Soviet society. They're not allowed. So in other words, this book really tells the legacy of blood, the afterlife of pogroms and blood libels, or the two most extreme manifestations of Tsarist the anti-Semitism in the Soviet lands. And I brought them together, ritual murder and pogroms, because they were often closely intertwined in history and in memory, not least because the accusation of blood libel, the allegation, again, the Jews murder Christian children for ritual purposes, frequently triggered anti-Jewish violence. Such events were and are considered central to the Jewish experience in late Tsarist Russia. Think about Kishinev and the Bailey's affair, Kishinev is the blood libel that spiraled into a pogrom. The Bailey's affair almost spiraled into a pogrom. 
Now, the Soviet regime boasted its break from the Tsarist period and proudly claimed to have eradicated these forms of anti-Semitism. But as, as I have discovered researching and writing this book, and I hope those of you who will read it will agree with me, life was much more complicated. Um, I want now, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that image, but I want to move now to two aspects of my research that I found um, particularly compelling. Um, and, the, and so let me tell you about, you know, that, that, that I think are, are very interesting and compelling. So despite the early attempts on the part of the state to root out um, ritual murder, to condemn it, to write, you know, to publish literature condemning it, the accusations did not wane in Soviet society. There are numerous cases of criminal investigations of ritual murder against Jews, including places like Moscow. So I'm not talking about the provinces of the empire. And they involve investigative commissions, medical experts who check, you know, the body uh, to see if uh, by any chance there was a ritual murder, local and central authorities, reports in the press, accounts by the secret police. Remember that unlike other places in Europe, the accusers are the ones who are put on trial and punished, not the Jews. Now, in my work, I try to explain the endurance and the permutation of the ritual murder accusation in this Soviet context. The occurrence of the blood libel captures, I think, some aspects of the nature of the Bolshevik experiment itself, this very violent project, and becomes uh, an indicator of its nature. Um, and of the fact that the Soviet system tried to modernize and secularize society by force and intense speed. So the accusation, of course, resulted from the encounter between Jews and peasant culture in the context of the system that promoted urbanization and produced new socioeconomic structures. Millions and millions of peasants are forced into the larger cities um, of the Soviet Union. And here for the first time, they encounter Jews in a new and a different position of authority. What I found most interesting, however, is that uh, I connect the ritual murder accusation with the anti-religious propaganda that is promoted by the state. Of course, one of the goals of the state is to create an atheistic society, right? Uh, we're done with all religions, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, enough, right? This is the, the Marxist idea. Um, and in carrying out this anti-religious propaganda, the state inadvertently played a role in maintaining powerful anti-Jewish myths. Uh, most notably, the anti-religious propaganda demonized Judaism in particular, the rituals of blood, the, the real rituals of blood, so to speak, circumcision and uh, kosher slaughtering because they were considered barbarian and anti-modern. Um, and it, it does that inadvertently, meaning the goal is not to be anti-Semitic. The goal is to uh, show how religion is evil. Um, so I'm showing you here some examples from the press, from the Soviet press, uh, but also from the Museum of, His of the History of Religion and Atheism. Um, what is interesting about this image, for example, I'm sorry, I forgot to translate from the Russian, um, but it says that the uh, circumcision is, is, a, is a barbarian ritual that is widespread among Jews and Muslims. But what is interesting is that the image it only depicts Jews, not Muslims. Um, we can come back to this later. But um, here you see, uh, you know, how many people attend, you know, went to see even youngsters went to see, you know, these images in the museum, and they were reminded of, you know, these rituals, these strange rituals among Jews. So the Sovietization uh, produced an unintended link between an the anti-Judaism campaigns 
and grassroots popular anti-Semitism. Never before in these territories had Judaism been publicly demonized by the state like in this context. Um, finally, um, I'll come back to that image in a second. The recurrence and transformation of ritual murder helps us measure social change and echoes in a way the process of Jewish women's empowerment in Soviet society. So I tried to, to look at the, the, the ritual murder accusation through the lenses of gender. Now, while the victim, while we see a change in the victim taking place throughout Central and Eastern Europe, meaning that um, the victim's gender identity has changed. There is no longer a young child, a boy usually, so Jews are no longer reenacting the killing of Christ, um, but it is a young woman, a non-Jewish woman who represents the nation, right? She embodies the nation and Jews represent the threat to the nation. So this is actually a, an extraordinary painting, extraordinary painting from 1898. It is a huge painting, uh, eight feet, eight by four, I think. It was commissioned by a Russian aristocratic family in 1898 um, by, and it was, um, the painter is the well-known uh, painter from Hungary, Mihaly Munkachi. Um, but this painting was, is not really from the Soviet period, it's from the previous period, uh, but it is interesting in showing you how, you know, how the, the identity of the victim changes. What I'm interested in is that only in the Soviet context, uh, women become the perpetrators, and it's no longer only men, as you see here. Usually in the traditional narrative, uh, it's, it's men, in the Soviet context, it's women, and of course, we need to disentangle myth from reality, but this does reflect um, the successful social mobility and professionalization of Jewish women uh, in the Soviet Union compared to Ukrainian and Belarusian women uh, who are in a way punished for their success um, and uh, through the blood libel accusation and become the predators. Um, Okay, so let me move on now to um, to um, uh, the other uh, you know uh, aspect of this book that I find very interesting, and I want to zoom in on one case study um, of one pogrom in the city of Trostinets, um, and I want to shed light on the legacy of the civil war um, pogroms. Um, which played out almost 10 years later in the escalating ethnic tensions in the town uh, of Trostinets in Ukraine. It was the summer of 1928. Um, clashes between Jewish and non-Jewish employees in a local factory broke out. Both sides engaged in mutually insulting the other side, bandits, speculators, troublemakers, and then um, as a reminder to their non-Jewish co-workers that hostility and brutality against Jews would no longer be tolerated, um, a Jewish employee said, where do you think you are? This is not 1919, meaning you cannot kill Jews like you did in 1919. So um, almost 10 years had, pa had passed since the pogrom of 1919. Um, According to different sources, uh, as many as 650 Jews were killed. And I'm interested in the memory. What happened to this memory? The memory of this violence remained alive and influenced ethnic relations for decades. Those victims, perpetrators, and bystanders who continued to live in the same town or region preserved the memory of anti-Jewish violence and actually at times referred to it to confront the adversities of Soviet life. In this case, uh, you know, the exceptional socioeconomic conditions, the, the, the unemployment of the 1920s. One of the reasons for the clashes in the summer of 1928 was of course the um, discontent uh, for the position of Jews in society and for the fact that the system had allowed them to reach 
a certain position of visibility. Um, this was an expression, I think, um, of many who wished to punish the Jews for their increased visibility in the economic and political sectors, not unlike the rage that took over the American South when Blacks refused to keep their heads down. These expressions of discontent and animosity stemmed also from a kind of nostalgia by anti-Semitic elements for the days when pogroms were real and when Jews knew their place. Now, the presence of this massive monument that you see here, which was erected by the Soviets when the Soviets reoccupied the town, further nurtured what I call the encumbered memory of violence of 1919 events. The memorial stood on the site of the mass grave where hundreds of Jews were buried, about one kilometer from the town center. For those Jews who, re who decided to stay in this town after the pogroms and did not flee the cities of death and, and look for new life in Moscow or Leningrad, um, this, the memory of violence was so vivid and so embedded in everyday life that it came to measure time. Throughout the interwar period, in fact, Jews referred to this great pogrom as in this town as der Churben, right, as the disaster. Um, all events were seen through the lenses of these pogroms, whether they affected the personal life of the individual or the life of the country, so that specific events were remembered and discussed based on whether they had occurred before the Churben, uh, or after the Churben. So it's so interesting, mind you, that they are not saying this happened before the revolution or after the revolution. What marks the time, right, uh, personal and the, the, the time, uh, historical time of, of, you know, of the state is the civil, the, this trauma. Um, and um, it's interesting that uh, we know from accounts that Jews uh, visited this mass grave regularly. So the, the memory of the pogrom remained an integral component of not only the town's local history, but it also shaped Jewish collective identity and consciousness. It became in a way a lieu de mémoire, a site of memory. Um, I'm showing you other images just to, to show you how huge this memorial is. It was built in red and gray stones. Um, it was one block in length and it loomed visibly from surrounding villages. Um, this Jewish site of memory, of course, became very problematic for many, particularly for those peasants, non-Jewish residents who were forced to remember and confront their own responsibility or the responsibility of their parents as perpetrators or onlookers of the massacre. The monument's existence could trigger an emotional response or anger or shame, especially among young Ukrainians. And it became a target of hostility and periodic violence. In fact, local peasants and residents of nearby villages would occasionally gather by the memorial with axes and metal tubes, dislodge the bricks and attempt to destroy it in a desperate effort to erase the memory of neighbors killing neighbors. They would want to forget, but the memorial, which was referred to actually as the Wailing Wall, is still standing today. Uh, it was not destroyed during the uh, German occupation and it is actually listed as an official historical monument in this region of Ukraine. Um, now, although the pogrom memorial in Trostinets stood out for its size, it was by no means unique. Pogrom memorials were set up in many towns and cities across the Soviet Union to commemorate pogrom victims in the aftermath of this violence. And I want to call your, your attention to the inscription here uh, in Russian on one side and on the other side in Yiddish, um, which reads, here rest 337 Jews of Trostinets brutally murdered on May 9th and May 10th, 1919 by the enemies of the Soviet state. 
So the message conveyed here, for anyone who passed by the memorial, Jews and non-Jews alike, was unambiguous. The Soviet state guarded Jews from uh, anti-Jewish violence. Um, David, do I have a few more minutes or? You certainly do. Okay, perfect. So let me, let me conclude as I wanted to. Yes, please. Um, so while the state, the Soviet hey, Siri, state- where are you? Um, while the Soviet state- uh, Wait, Alyssa, I, I just mute, I, 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 I muted you by accident. Here I am. Hey, Siri, where are you? Go ahead, please. Can, can people hear me? Okay, perfect. So um, while the state stigmatized this form of violence, the pogroms, is socially unacceptable, pogroms did occur in the Soviet Union, uh, but rarely, on rare occasions. They were exceptions to the rule, a kind of uh, an aberration. Even in the post-war years, when the central authorities actively promoted anti-Semitism, and grew more and more unresponsive to the complaints on the part of Soviet Jews, the state never crossed the line of allowing uh, or tolerating or not intervening uh, in the case of pogroms like um, the Tsar did, like, like, you know, like it happened in Tsar's Russia. Um, so, um, and I, I just want to bring here the, um, the words that I think capture the ambivalence of, um, of you know, of, uh, of condemning anti-Semitism, but um, in Soviet society, but, but, um, but, but the, it captures the fact that, you know, on the one hand, you have the authorities condemning anti-Semitism, but anti-Semitism is still very, very um, deeply rooted, popular anti-Semitism. And I want to conclude to capture this ambivalence with the words, uh, although I hate to do it, but I'll conclude with the words of Stalin, um, who, um, uh, who, you know, the words that capture this myth and the ambivalence of this myth um, about the fact that there were no uh, pogroms in the Soviet Union. Um, so it was in the 1940s. <clears throat> Can people hear me? Yes, okay. It was in the late 1940s in the wake of widespread popular and state-sponsored anti-Semitism when two distinguished Jewish writers approached Stalin and they complained about you know, anti-Semitism, about discrimination against Jews. And very annoyed, Stalin said, are there any pogroms? And then he replied to his own question, urging them to stop the nagging. No, there are no pogroms. So just be content, right? Don't complain. As long as there are no pogroms, there is no anti-Semitism, right? And it's very ambivalent. It's very problematic, of course. Um, so, I, I just want to reiterate the fact that I think that this book um, uh, is about myths and how they function. Um, I try to look at how myths move people to believe incredible things and commit unspeakable acts. <clears throat> Here I'm referring to the blood libel and the accusation of Judeo-Bolshevism that was one of the uh, motivations for killing Jews during the pogroms of the Civil War. Um, I'm interested and I, I think I show how political leaders negotiate, and I just showed you actually in the words of Stalin, how they negotiate and manipulate myths to their own ends and how myths can work on our imagination and interfere with our ability to see the past clearly. Um, I really hope that this book can help us better understand the history of anti-Semitism um, in the interwar period, but also in our times. Today, we are grappling with, you know, the rise of anti-Semitism in contemporary Europe and in the US. And we sometimes have 
trouble understanding how anti-Semitism can appear in countries that officially condemn it, right? Like in this country, anti-Semitism is officially condemned. Um, and under political systems that define themselves in opposition to um, uh, ethno-national political systems. Looking past um, states self uh, mythologizing about civic and political inclusion and instead a popular belief system that categorize peoples hierarchically and that largely determine political possibilities, I think this can help us see how and why anti-Semitism, like racism, like other racist ideologies, can flourish while being widely denied. And I think I will leave it at that. Thank you for listening. Wonderful, Alyssa. If you would unshare your screen. Uh, so yes. Stop the share. Here I am. Okay, very good. And you'll just, um, this way we can speak to one another. Um, and uh, I, we've got some time for questions. I'm going to actually begin the questions so that everybody's got a chance to um, think about it and add their questions quickly to the chat. Two things that you said near the end of your presentation um, really raised some questions about our contemporary experience for me. Uh, I know that you're not a political commentator and please refuse to answer these questions if you like, but um, in your discussion of the pogrom memorial and um, the controversies, the local population, their constant reminder um, of what, you know, at least their neighbors or their parents had been involved in, um, and you know their desire to erase it to some degree unsuccessfully, uh, but we in our country elsewhere as well. But we've lived through it. Are living through serious debates about the place of memorials. Should certain kinds of memorials be erased for other kinds of memorials and so forth? Memorials are wrought. They're they're very heavy, um, and so I'm wondering about your thought on that topic. Um, secondly. Um, there is a uh, question, you, you referred to myth-making. Uh, obviously, I could ask about uh, myth-making and the manipulation of myth in our own political context, um, but one of the uh, our questioners uh, added on chat the question whether the Jewish section of the Communist Party was involved or supportive of the Soviet myth-making or you know, how did that work? So I don't know if there are two or three questions here, but take it the way you want to go. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, I mean, the, the question that you asked, David, is, uh, is, a, is a very complicated question, right? It's um, um, very, very complicated. I mean, from, and from, from the historian's um, perspective, um, these, um, you know, for me, it was it was it was really a discovery to find out that these memorials existed. And again, this memory is completely lost because of the Holocaust that took place uh, twenty years later in in these um, in these same territories. Um, uh, Jews set up these memorials with the support of the state, right? Um, the state allowed them to have these memorials. Um, and as long as they didn't get too much in the way of, um, uh, you know, of claiming uh, a Jewish victimhood in, in the Civil War, um, I think these memorials were also set up, you know, uh, at a time when the state was committed to some degree to remembering these, uh, these events. Uh, you know, the memorials that you speak about or I mean I guess I guess it um I guess that I don't know how to answer that question actually I mean it's a very very it's a very provocative question um um because um yeah so let me leave it at that it's a uh, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll remember I'll remember David <laughs> um so the Yipsectia um the Yipsectia 
is, um, is an official institution, right? So the Evsetia really has to um, um, go along with what the state decides to do. And the Evsetia, by the way, as you know, is dismantled in 1930, the Jewish, um, the Jewish section of the Communist Party. So the Evsetia does, um, the Evsetia needs to negotiate between um, serving in a way um, the Jews who complain about anti-Semitism or who want to, um, you know, want to have the right to remember um, even publicly these, um, this trauma um, and negotiate between this and between the state. The state, as I said, is very ambivalent, officially condemns the anti-Semitism, but, um, you know, la raison d'etat is what drives the decision of the state. If it is in my interest, I will remember the pogroms. And it was in the interest of the state in order to condemn Tsarist Russia, which was the, the you know, the obscene political enemy uh, of the Soviet Union. But afterwards, in the late 20s and 1930s, I'm not that interested in remembering these pogroms. I'm much more interested in building a new society based on the brotherhood of people. So I'm not going to dwell too much on the fact that Ukrainians killed Jews. I see there are many, many questions. So there are a lot of, yeah. So two, um, I think, quick, quick questions. Lisa wants to know about the depth of the historical memory. Um, would um, any of the populations have recalled the Khmelnytsky massacres and um, would that have informed some of the energy behind pogroms, for example? Um, and then uh, Melanie just simply want, would like to know something about the status of Jews in the Ukraine today. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Um, so the question about the Khmelnytsky, the Gzeres Tachvetat, the, the Khmelnytsky uprising in 1648 and the thousands of Jews who were killed. And actually some of the programs do take place in the same, uh, in the same regions of Ukraine. So there are layers of memory, both among Jews and non-Jews. Um, now, what is closer in time, of course, are the pogroms of 1881-1882 when Tsar Nicholas II is assassinated and you have this wave of the anti-Jewish pogroms. Um, and then you have the Kishinev pogrom in 1903 and the pogroms of 1905-1906, which are also in Ukraine mostly. So you have these layers of memory that are passed on from generation to generation, both among the victims and among the perpetrators. But this violence is very different because it takes place in the aftermath of World War I, um, in, in, in the aftermath of, of an unprecedented violence, the violence of World War I, when people are, get, are accustomed to carrying out, to murdering others and to witnessing murder. So, um, so this really plays, and then you have the Bolshevik Revolution, which is ex extremely violent, um, and um, so, so, um, so that that the con the general context is is crucial. Um, the other question, oh, contemporary Ukraine. So the memory of these programs, I actually wanted to show you an image, but I won't. Uh, because I, I unshared the screen, but I have it at, uh, at the end. It's another kind of memorial. It's a memorial of Petlyura. Petlyura uh, is the leader of the Ukrainian directorate, and he is considered, um, although it is more complicated than, I, than what I am about to say, but let's just simplify. He is considered um, to be responsible uh, or at least partly responsible for the violence, especially uh, in certain areas. So today he is remembered as a hero, right? He is remembered as someone who fought on behalf of Ukrainian ident national identity, uh, you know, in the war against the Soviet Union. And, and to be fair, it, it is, you know, it is in part true that he fought against, uh, against um, the Bolshevik power, but it's interesting that he is remembered only as a hero uh, in Ukraine. Uh, textbooks, for example, 
um, there is no reference whatsoever to the assassination, to the, you know, to, to, um, to the pogroms and to instances of anti-Jewish violence. So the memory is selective, of course. Um, a great question that I don't think we've ever gotten before at, at a book talk. Um, oh, somebody wanted to know what would you recommend to an up and coming uh, graduate student, PhD candidate, uh, as the next piece of research, right? Oh, that's a that's a wonderful uh, that's a wonderful question. I think that um, these this kind of violence um, we are just touching now the tip of the iceberg, right? That's the expression. Uh, there is so much more um, that um, that should be done. Uh, the experience of women, Jewish women, um, um, agunot, uh, women who, who experienced rape and what happened to them and how, um, uh, you know, the, the impact that that had on, uh, on them, on their, you know, uh, on, marriage, not marriage, how they interacted with religious authorities, how they, uh, you know, they, they left and probably their parents encouraged them to leave these cities um, and forget, right? Because it's not only about, I mean, historians want to remember, but people want to forget, right? That's the, the, the natural response to trauma. Um, what is so interesting, I think, is that we need to study much more the connection between this violence and the Holocaust and the memory of this um, of this violence among the perpetrators and uh, how it played out only 20 years later. It's only 20 years. So it's very vivid. It's um, so there's so much more, I think, that needs to be done. There's so many uh, the materials are very rich, they are available, they have been digitized. Um, if one knows Yiddish, Hebrew, uh, maybe some Russian and some Ukrainian. <laughs> so learn your languages first. Just a few <laughs> languages. That's well, that's part of doing a PhD, right? Um, uh, Amalia um, asks, uh, she, she refers to the common uh, notion that uh, Ukrainians are savage anti-Semites, and she wants to know whether this reputation is deserved. Um, you know, savage is, um, I, I wouldn't use that term. I mean, Ukraine, I think that context is crucial. Um, the, you know, there is a civil war, and in the context of a civil war, as we know, the minorities suffer the most, and Jews were the minority group, right? Um, you have also ethnic Germans, Mennonites, who suffered during the pogroms, not quite as much, but they also were targeted. So that we have to keep in mind. Ukraine suffered in terms of geographical areas more than any other area uh, on the Eastern Front. There was a famine. Uh, there had been a war since 1914. So people are desperate. People literally have nothing to eat. Um, so in this context, first of all, it's very easy to build up these myths, right? Oh, maybe Jews did always kill children for ritual purposes, right? Uh, in this context, it becomes more, uh, it makes more sense. Um, and also this accusation that all Jews are communists. After all, um, again, the context and trying to understand is very important. Um, now, while most Jews were opposed to the Bolsheviks, in the context of the Civil War, most Jews will side with the Bolsheviks. Why? Because out of all the troops carrying out pogroms against Jews, the Bolsheviks carry out less, or at least those troops who carry out um, who kill Jews um, are put on trial or killed actually that Soviet style. So, um, so in this context, um, um, we, uh, you know, we have to keep in mind the context. Was there strong, deeply rooted anti-Jewish um, stereotypes and popular anti-Semitism in Ukraine? Yes, I'm not sure that it was that it was more. Um, 
that it was stronger than than other areas, but because of the context, you know, uh, it explodes or implodes, um, I guess. Okay, and now I've got the most important question of all, which is how can people buy your book? <laughs> that is the most important question. So here's the book that has, um, I don't know if you can see it. it, it's a beautiful cover actually. And the painting is the painting of, um, well, I had it on the PowerPoint, um, um, of victims of the pogrom. It was, um, it was um, the painter is Manuel Schertmann from Odessa, a very talented painter who perished in the Holocaust. Um, so you can buy it on Amazon uh, or Oxford, Oxford, um, Oxford University Press. Okay, and when we're finished uh, with the pandemic, can people who have purchased it uh, seek you out to get a signature? For sure, with great, with great pleasure, yes. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, and of course, uh, we'll have copies uh, in the Jewish Theological Seminary Library. Uh, and I invite uh, you all to visit us when such visiting is possible. Uh, we are open to all. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Alyssa, thank for an absolutely wonderful presentation, thought-provoking, uh, informative, uh, and for someone not in the field, uh, like myself, really eye-opening to, to ways of thinking, uh, first of all, to events that I didn't know very much about, but also to ways of thinking about them that really are, as I say, eye-opening. So thank you for that. It's uh, good to be educated. Um, let me thank, uh, thank, thank all of you for coming and invite you to future library sponsored book talks, cultural events online, uh, and whatever else uh, we offer. Follow our announcements and sign on as soon as you can. And we look forward to providing you with interesting programs like the, white, the one tonight. Please know that uh, the vast majority will be recorded. So if uh, you have any friends uh, who are interested, you can send them to our website and we usually have them up by the next day. Um, so thank you all, good night, be well. Uh, and thank you. Thank Be you. Be well. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much.